Peter Pardini, Peter Curtis Pardini. How you doing? I'm good, man. Um, I was I was uh, going to introduce you is 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 the way I know you, but I, I I know Peter because about two years ago I saw this documentary on Netflix called uh, Now More Than Ever: uh, The History of Chicago. It, this is the band Chicago, and I grew up listening to all that music in Chicago. But what really knocked me out about the film was that um, yours stood apart from all the other fair that because they've always been good at self promotion. There's been behind the music. There have been you know anniversary uh, shows that were taped and interviews. But what I liked so much about yours is that it was, I saw with all of the interstitial stuff that you put in, it, it, you, you kind of told it with a cinematic language, which is something that a film student thinks about, but I loved um, the, way, the way you use whatever available means there were to create a compelling film. And, and I contacted you and um, we've since been friends and it's, a, it's certainly an honor to have you here, but now I know a lot of the stories, but everyone else doesn't know them. And it's nothing taught you. I just want to, I want to know about you. I want to know um, how, how much work had you done uh, before you made that, that documentary? Because it, it, it looked like it was done by a seasoned director. And then when I found out how old you are, I couldn't believe it. Well, it was a situation where it kind of happened organically and it wasn't, I didn't start working with the band to make the movie. I had originally started working with them because my uncle was a new member and they needed someone to come in and do behind the scenes on their Christmas album, which back way back in 2010, which just this October was the 10th anniversary of. So it's, it's been 10 years since I've been working with the guys, but about three years after I had been touring with them and filming, you know, little road documentaries that was for their fan club, essentially. Um, the History of the Eagles documentary came out and I had talked with Lee Lochnane, the trumpet player in the band. And I was, we were talking about the possibility of them having one, a doc, like a real documentary, not something that was, you know, cause the last thing I think they had was the 2000 or 1999 behind the music. And that was only, you know, what, 30 years into their career, there was another 20 years after that we could delve into. And so by default, I had three or four years of experience with Chicago. And I had heard all the stories without ever thinking or knowing that I would make a documentary about the career. Um, Cause I thought I was going to go on the road a couple of times and be done with it and then move on and try to do other work. But I was lucky enough to continue to work with them and move up the rank, so to speak, to make a movie and uh it turned into yeah now more than ever so well i mean did, did you feel that when you did approach lee about that did you think oh, i'm gonna do something a little different because knowing you the way i do now there's a uh, you really take pride in what you do and it's 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 um uh, that's it isn't that well, a way of saying yeah you know yeah, that well, you really take pride in stuff <laughs> i do and it's like but I, I could do better. I mean, what well, I'm right. I know what you mean. And I think that I've always, one of my strong suits is that whenever I get a opening, like in a door, like I'll push it open. And it's, it's the, the problems for me have been opening the doors, but then once they're cracked open, I can shove them wide open. And I think Lee even, he might've even been the one that called me and was like, have you seen the history of the Eagles documentary? And uh, I know, I think that they probably asked like, how much can we do this for? And I told them a number that was way lower than what it would be mm -hmm. just because I knew that like, once we got into it, like we would have to continue to do it. And, you know, you always want to get the opportunity to do something and not, you know, be in a corner of not being able to tell it the way you want to tell it. And that was one of the first things we talked about was, and Lee was on board with it to begin with. And all the guys were on board with it was like, it has to be, it can't be a 
soft pedal of what the history of because a lot of these documentaries with these bands are just like you can tell that yeah they admit to doing drugs they admit to you know whatever they were doing in the 60s and 70s which every band was but they still kind of hide it and it's like why even talk about it if you're not going to talk about it and so i said we'll talk about all the good things we'll talk about all the bad things but like you really have to be honest um and yeah it was like a process of we started in May of 2013 and it premiered on CNN in January of 2017. And I was editing little changes up until like the day before it aired because of time constraints with commercials and all that stuff. So it was really a three and a half year process. Was, was there ever that moment like in Almost Famous when uh, they look at the interviewer and say, when did you get so professional? Because they, they'd known you since you were a kid. Well, yeah. I mean, I was right out of college when I started with them. And I always made the joke that it was it was like Almost Famous, just without any of the drugs or partying yeah, right. <laughs> when I went on the road with them. But they had gotten all that out of the way. Um, but yeah, I do remember when I first started, like Jimmy, I'd ask him questions that were just so stupid. Like, really? how did it feel out there tonight, Jimmy, with the crowd? When you look out and he's like, buddy, come back to me when you have better questions. What? So they kind of helped me through learning how to ask questions and try to find angles on things that weren't, that they haven't been asked before because they've been asked everything. Uh, that surprises me because you're a cat that doesn't suffer fools. You know, I, was, it, it, that, I, was, I can't picture you being a meek, but I mean, we all are. I mean, we all start out that way. You know, they... I get nervous before everything. I got nervous really... before this just because it's like I always want to perform. But even with like, you know, when I first started with them, I was lucky that my uncle was there. So I had family there, which how many people get that when they go on and get an opportunity like this? But it was still, you know, I listened to Chicago when I was younger. I didn't know all their music, but I knew the greatest hits. I knew, you know, Pretty much that that album, Chicago Nine. I knew all those songs by heart, and then you know, couple couple of the deep cuts, but not really. But it's still like you're on the bus, and then there's the guy who wrote "Color My World" and "Make Me Smile," and it's you do get as a for me as like how old was I? Twenty three, twenty four. I just turned twenty four, mm -hmm. and uh, it was not scary or anything, but it's like, oh man, I want these guys to think I'm good at at this. And uh, I had never really done that. I'd made documentaries in high school just with friends mm. um, following people around in senior year of high school, but I'd never done anything like this. Did you feel as though there was a burden, you know, once you got into it, do you feel everything that you'd ever learned or even read about you had to put into the film? Yeah. And I would say that that's one of, one of the things that I think almost every filmmaker ends up for better or worse and a lot of the times for the better is they they become more honed and they don't try to prove themselves with every shot mm -hmm. like <clears throat> i think the you look at someone like paul thomas anderson who started off with boogie nights and mm -hmm. magnolia and these really flashy movies and then he ends up making there will be blood which is like a mix of the two right and even something like goodfellas is really just insanely flashy but also just direct and i think when i started um all those little interstitial things you were talking about like those were those were shot because i wanted to basically get permission to shoot short films essentially and shoot on film and do that and they were there for a specific reason because at first we didn't have a lot of footage to use from archival because uh, it was, took a long time to find a lot of that stuff that was ended up in the movie. And so for a scene where he's talking about writing just you and me, mm -hmm. there was enough, I mean, I don't know what to cut to. I, I hate documentaries, especially music ones where it's like just randomly cuts to pictures of band members when they're telling yeah. a story about something. And it's like, I don't, I'm not following and I'm bored because it's yeah. not telling a story. So fortunately for them and for me, they let me, do this but i did it in such a way that was so cost effective 
because mm. I was always thinking that the project was going to be ended. Like they were going to like call me and say, stop making the movie. You're spending too much money. So I always had that in the back of my head and we were not spending almost anything <clears throat> on those interstitial scenes because I was trying to keep it cost effective. But we did shoot on film. We got Panavision. I got Panavision, called them, got them to give us a grant because I called them and I said, you know, we're, we want to shoot film. We don't really have a budget at all, but we want to shoot film and that we are not going to shoot film if we can't get some sort of grant. And uh, they gave us like all their 35 millimeter equipment. And you shot the interviews on 35, not the interviews, the, uh, the, like the recreation scenes. Right. So we shot all those on either 16 millimeter, or 35 millimeter and Panavision bless them, gave us all that wow. stuff for like a thousand dollars to rent. So that was, was amazing. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the biggest costs on the movie were licensing. <laughs> I mean, doing licensing, traveling to New York to interview Clive Davis, that sort of thing. So it's, it's amazing. I, I thought that, um, cause I want, as I tell you, I watch it to fall asleep sometimes, not because yeah. it bores me. It's your lullaby, but it's just, it's, I love hearing these songs, um, the earlier stuff, but I still like, you know, the later incarnations and in, in what they're doing now, because that's sort of in, in line with their, their origins. But I love that scene. It's, it's one of those inserts where it's, you're, you're, it's, it's the turning film projector with the light mm -hmm. going. And that's like right out of Mean Streets, you know, the, which, which I love the, the very beginning, whether you knew it or not, but it, it was so cool. But at the same time, um, did you uh, feel comfortable with the subject? Because, and you could describe, I mean, there, there are some uncomfortable things. You did mention drugs, but you, you know, there's, there's the suicide of, of their main member. Uh, or their original member and just one of the more trailblazing guitar players to have ever graced a rock and roll bandstand, Terry Kath. Like, there are, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I obviously had to ask about it. And the thing is, is that each of them is so different in how they talk about things. So mm -hmm. I kind of had an idea before I asked the questions, like, I tried to ask them all the same things, no matter what the topic was, but in slightly different ways so that the thing that amazed me most in the movie was when I was putting it together was how they would literally say the same words mm -hmm. without being fed lines. Right. And that comes from, you know, answering the same questions over and over for 50 plus years. But for Terry, it was a thing where I asked them all differently because I knew someone like Robert doesn't like talking about it. None of them like talking about it, but he really mm -hmm. seems the most uncomfortable. And uh, they were really close. I mean, they were brothers, essentially. And uh, so you ask him in a way, you know, like, hey, you know, we're going to talk about Terry. Um, I know that you know what we're going to talk about, but let's talk about it at how you want to talk. How did it, not how did it make you feel? Obviously it was awful, but you, you try to find different verbiage for each guy. Mm -hmm. And Lee, I mean, Lee's the one that no matter what the topic was, I mean, you've seen the movie, like he will look directly in the camera and cry where most people will just like look away. And I'm just constantly amazed by that where he'll just be vulnerable on, on screen. And I remember him telling me about him and Jimmy used to take acting classes in the 70s in terms of, so they have a presence that they've learned, they learned how to be on camera and so I think that he's just super comfortable on camera. And uh, I'm just still amazed by that ability to not hide it. Because I know that if I were talking about something like that, I would want to like, you know, stop the interview or something. But it was really weird for me, like these weird things in life that happen where these kind of synchronicities that, that match up and... I felt like watching all that footage and making that movie, like I began to start to know those guys. Like I could recognize it in the people I was making the movie with, like the friendship. Yeah. They were just funny. Like you watch I, the, like the raw footage of that ar archival that I ended up getting from Jimmy. Cause all those home videos were Jimmy's and those guys were just funny goofs. And so at a certain point, I started to feel like I knew those guys and started to feel some emotion thinking about Terry 
and what could have been. And it's really weird. And I know we'll probably talk about it later, but um, I did another documentary called Fat Mm -hmm. where we were shooting at this place in West Hills, Woodland Hills area at this house. And I only just found out that the house we shot my next documentary in was right across the street from where Terry had accidentally shot himself. Oh man. Like literally I had driven past it hundreds of times and never known it. And so that like was kind of chilling. And you walk over. I went out and I, I drove past once I found out the address and it looks, I mean, it looks like it hasn't changed since what 1978. I mean, that's when it happened. It, It doesn't look, it looks like it could still be from that era. It's right there on Fallbrook. And, uh, I, it was really eerie because you start to think, you know, not as it connected, but just, I I drove past this hundreds of times to make my very next movie. And it's just kind of this weird synchronicity thing. I don't know if that's narcissistic to say. No, it's not. It's, it's, (laughs) it's it's just one in, in, in hopefully hundreds of those little moments that you'll have in life where things do have uh, some kind of causal connection or, or just eerie coincidence. I think those well, even are just you and me, like we, like, yeah. you know, like 20 people that I know and we've never like you yeah. live in Chicago and you know, like 20 people that are oddly specific. Ah, isn't that cool? Well, yeah. what, but at the same time, I think that you do feel that loss, the Terry Kath loss because of how you really, you dug into the positive things. It wasn't yeah. when we return, Kath delves into alcohol and drugs. They all did, you know, yeah. there's no, it, it's, you, you, you feel the loss because of how you really um, explored that music, musical camaraderie and talking to these fellas. Now, could you say that being around professionals in a different industry, how does that impact, especially them, because they're hardworking guys and um, really, really mean it when they when they talk. How did that impact you as, let's say, if, if you want to mark it as a, um, a formidable experience in your, you know, ever burgeoning creative life? Uh, I cosmically lucky because they are insanely efficient and i mean after 50 i mean when i started with them it was 43 years it's about they're about to have their 53rd anniversary but 43 years and it's just a well-oiled machine it doesn't matter i mean the funny thing is that lee i'll talk to lee or i'll call him when i'm not on the road with them i'll say oh where are you guys right now and he's like i don't know i just get on the bus we go to the next place and we play the show and then we get on the bus, we go to the next show. And for me to be around people who were highly successful to begin with and probably didn't fully, well, I know they didn't, they didn't fully even know why they were successful to begin because they just like playing music. Right. And just were so good that, I mean, they really only had like a two year, span from when they started to when they were number one i mean it's crazy that's insanely fast Mm -hmm. and they had to go through all the trials and tribulations of bad contracts Mm -hmm. a death of a friend drugs near overdoses for several of them i'm sure and estrangements estrangements to the point where they got back to i think probably post satara being work working musicians again where that was what they wanted to do was just be be and play music and for me because i know that that's where they started when their first albums and the second album the first song is moving in and it's literally the lyrics i use it twice in the movie the lyrics talk about all they want to do is play music that's it and it's true and that's that's what they do now so seeing them on the road and seeing especially their stamina I, i don't have that I'm not yet. I'm very well. Yeah, I'm very driven and I can get things done on time and quickly, but I can't do like 10 hours in a row. I can't do eight hours in a row. 
<clears throat> I have to like, unless I'm on set, I can do that. But when I'm editing, I, I can't sit there for eight hours. I can't do it. Well, but you know, it's just, I think in Fresno terms, where you're from, <laughs> you know, it's a great five hours. That's that's standard. Yeah. Chicago might be different, although I'm more. Well, they I'm can go on the stage. <laughs> right. My point was, is they go on stage. <laughs> right. Every, six nights a week. I mean, not this year, obviously, but six nights a week. And they're doing two and a half hour shows in their seventies. Right. And it's great. It's yeah. not like, it's not a tribute act. Like you go up there and you watch their show and it's like, this is the best band I've heard. And I don't know why it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I remember talking to Lee about, it was like in 2014 when D'Angelo had come out with a new album and it was, Oh his, yeah. It was his first album in 15 years. And D'Angelo is one of my top favorite solo artists. And I was so like, cause they just dropped it. Go did you it, ever, but. did you, did you ever see, and you could continue in a second. There was an episode on the Chris Rock show. It's like, you'd have to see it in a rerun where it's D'Angelo, two of the guys from Tony, Tony, Tony. And it's like, <laughs> mind blowing. It's, it was, this is after all of like the, the very mellow soul music of the eighties. And then come the late nineties, yeah. like D'Angelo comes in. It just, just so good. Anyway, continue. Well, Voodoo was Voodoo is one of my favorite albums, and I think every song on it's perfect. And I was talking to Lee about how he's just gone for 15 years, and Lee knew who he was, but it's like, you know, he's focused on what they're doing. And I said, this guy D'Angelo just came out with a new album, and it's number one. He's been gone for 15 years, and uh, it was an interesting thought, like you can go away and come back and be number one. But if you stay for 53 years, you people take you for granted a little bit. And it's almost like the number one thing I hear when I say that I tour with Chicago, film with Chicago is they're still going. And it's like, then you're at the shows and there's 5,000 people there at right. every single place, a hundred shows a year for 53 straight years. All ages. All ages. So Obviously, people know they're around, but then you talk to other people and they're like, oh, is Peter Cetera still there? Mm. And I think that there's a weird thing in life where people don't pay attention to the people who are right. consistent and around forever. They are taken for granted. But if D'Angelo comes back after 15 years, it's like, oh, my God, D'Angelo, we right, got to get. Right, right. Yeah. So it's that work and that's what i want out of life is to just i would love to be the guy like who's making a movie every other year and working on something all the time i don't want to i love paul thomas anderson i love stanley kubrick i love david fincher but i i don't know if if i had a choice if i would want to be making a movie once every six years i don't know if that would that's that's not what i, I, want. I don't think that would be you because you are con and you will talk about the other work that you've done but um you pretty work. I mean, you work hard and that's, that's, that's important. I guess you have to be like Chicago in a sense, because when you mention other artists, I, I'd spoken to Lee once and I was asking about, about certain people. And did you see these people? Said, well, no, because we were always on tour, you know, you almost always have to be on tour in, in your head. They only and, saw people they played with or were like on a show with. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying about you because is they're you producer, should, yeah. with you, you should probably um, just think about the stuff that you're doing, what you do anyway, and it, and it shows. Was how much were you concerned? You know, everybody, you know, having made one documentary, um, and I was talking to someone else whose project is it's in, great, by in, the way. Thank you. His project has been in limbo, and he's got that like, like, like a week and a half before Christmas. Did you hear back from the distributor? I was like, nothing's happening between now and, <laughs> and like February. So just chill. And, and one of the things that um, I was thinking about is that you, and it's not a dollar driven anxiety. It's, it's like you want the people that you made it for to give you that sort of approval, that approbation that you've done right by them. Did you have yeah. any of that? Did, have you had that kind of uh, anxiety? in the past with these guys before the film came out? Yeah. Uh, 
they all saw it. So we, the movie premiered in Sedona at um, the Sedona Film Festival. And, you know, they really did it up because the band, I mean, the whole band went. And that was really like one of the best days of my life where they all came to Sedona, Arizona, played two shows and watched the movie I made. And it was the first time in, so that was 2016. So it was six years I'd been working for them. It was the first time that I felt like I had done something that caused them to do something. Like it was because of something I did and everything else. It was, I mean, it's Chicago. Like you're there because Chicago is doing a show or because Chicago's on a TV show. But that was, that felt like I had arrived to a certain next level in the, the state, the journey that I am on to eventually get to the next level and the next right. level, the next level. So <clears throat> I had shown them all the movie before that because I just sent them all the DVD or Blu-ray or whatever. And they all got back to me and said they loved it, but you never really know if they're just saying it because it's like the money's been spent and it's over and it's like, they're not the type to, they don't like push you down or they, they are the most loyal, good people that I could ever hope to work with. And so I still had that like nerves before Sedona's the screening and, and Sedona did it up. Like we were in uh, an auditorium with like 1300 people watching the movie with surround 5.1 and a DCP. And we had really done it up. <clears throat> and when the part, like there, you, you start to hear the audience reaction and I was kind of looking around at the band members and you can see that they're like in into it because the audience is reacting and they feed off that because they've fed off that for 50 years. And, you know, and then you have the terror, like one of my proudest moments as a filmmaker, even though it was a sad part of the movie was when a moment in the movie where they're talking about right before Terry's passing and the music cuts out. Yeah. That's my favorite. And, and it's, it, I basically, it's it's kind of a steal from Boogie Nights with, you know, the William H. Macy's yeah. demise. But it was so effective Jeez. because the, the audience, right. I could hear clapping to the beat as, and then the, the sound cut out and, I, and it was like, and you could hear some people stopping clapping and this one woman goes, oh. Yep. And I was like, okay, like, this is not something really to be happy about because of what it's, what it's talking about but it's like people are into the movie and then even more so at the end i was like almost in tears because the end of the movie the original ending of the movie did not have the rock and roll hall of fame in it mm -hmm. because they had not gotten in by the time i had finished the movie so there's this whole section of the movie where like i can't believe they're not in the hall of fame and i was like right. what are we going to do about this because we were going to premiere and they had gotten in by the time we were showing it so i put a little thing on the chiron that said and they just got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and all thirteen hundred people in the in the audience like burst into applause, and it was like I'm getting chills even thinking about it because that means that they loved the movie, and they're so happy that these guys that they just watched the whole journey got what they deserved. Where and was that screening? It was in Sedona at um, the high school, so at the right on the outskirts of the main eighty nine freeway and or highway and uh just in this auditorium with like it was like a really nice like theater with like 1200 seats 1300 seats wow but were, were the band members there as well yeah they were all i mean we were all sitting there and then we went and did a q a afterwards um, i would imagine that that was the first real time they saw it because for you that's know, what i'm saying yeah it's like sitting down for a dvd for a story they know but it's almost like that was the great coming out party. And yeah. now what, uh, you know, I mentioned something about them holding you in a, a higher regard or, or on, on, a, on a, treating you differently because you really pulled it off famously. What was the, uh, what was the evolution of, of Jimmy Pankow, you know, giving you, finally giving you his, his home movies? Well, was he ransoming him? Well, yeah, I, I put him under a ransom. I threatened his children. <laughs> um, no, you know, 
all that stuff. I mean, if you can think about footage that's 40 plus years old at that point and no one's ever seen it and it's yours and it's very personal stuff and personal to you. I mean, it was essentially all silent film of them just hanging out backstage or, you know, screwing around. But, um, yeah, it was like, I think it was beginning of 2014. So like a year, two years maybe after we had started making it. So maybe 2015, but um, it was, we were in like Santa Rosa or something with the crew and we were there to interview Peter Chivarelli and we weren't even going to interview Jimmy because uh, we had already interviewed him twice and he, he loves to talk. Like he, <laughs> we already had like six hours, but I was like, Jimmy, I know you have all these pictures and footage. I know you have it. And he was kind of like, yeah, but you know, I don't know what I want to use it for. And I was like, you're using it for this. This movie. This like, is like, you guys are, we're making this movie. You guys are funding it. Like what else are you going to hold, hold it for? And he's like, yeah, I guess so. I guess did so. You, did you process the actual film? No. So luckily that was already processed years earlier, like in 2010. And I got the SP. I said, Jimmy, I will go to Nashville when we're off the road. I will come to you. I will literally bring a hard drive and you can just drag the files over to my hard drive. And that's what we did. And we had some via Antonori wine together and uh, just sat there. His basement is like all vinyl on the wall, like gold records, platinum records. And, uh, it was just really cool and it really uh it saved the movie in a lot of ways because what you see is not what that movie was without that footage like mm -hmm. and that's any documentary really i mean that's one of the biggest complaints about a lot of music documentaries is you know there's no music there's no footage there's no pictures what like what are we watching this for so well that's what i loved about the film is that you were creative i mean you uh um, when they're talking about the house that they rented yeah. in North Hollywood and they had their names on, on, you know, the, whatever you want to call it, the, the shelf of the bathroom, you wrote those names. In. Yeah. Some people, I took it as compliments. Some people thought that was real footage. And then there were some Dude. people online, some people online, you know, you know, there's always trolls online. They're like, I don't know what it is with these little interstitial scenes. They That's what I wrote that as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I just, I Your felt face like cares. Uh, <laughs> just to keep it balanced you know i'm your biggest fan and troll there you go but <laughs> yeah we were uh yeah so we shot you know stuff like that we shot like the shower head turning on we sh i mean little things that i don't know for me it it makes it more immersive and uh was your wife in the film did she make a scene my wife is in the film she was in the just you and me oh, um, that was her yeah, she's in the scene where he breaks down the door, and then she's also in one shot earlier where the camera's going by some people in a in a fake crowd, um, oh. and then words fade up over her face. <laughs> well, if that were you, did you play Walt in that scene? I wasn't. I don't think I was in. I think my feet might have been in it in one of the scenes Maybe. where, like, Robert's uh, yeah. writing a song. It might have been my feet, but. I wasn't oh, in the wait, movie. Was that, was that Robert or was that Walt that uh, wrote just... Jimmy. So Jimmy, that was a friend I had who I worked with at uh, New York Film Academy who looked like Jimmy, but we never showed his face. But no, kind of. Uh, but he yeah. was pissed, man, and she was she was mad too. <laughs> you that really came across. That really came across. He's a trip, man. Did has his brother, the great John Pankow, the actor, ever come to this? Come see the shows. I've met him a few times and he's a great guy. I met him in New York a few times because um, I think that's where at least then he was living. Um, and I learned a lot about him. I, I guess he was in the original well, you production. Well, to live in L.A., right? Yeah, of course. And uh, I, he's in the original production of Amadeus on Broadway, I believe. Really? Um, so he's a legit... Jimmy's a legit actor too, but... Uh, well, let's yeah, talk about that. You, let's, they, you put them in... Uh, your next movie, Rolling Thunder, and I would think that uh, <laughs> they didn't do it just as a favor. They're like, "All right, uh, Peter's not fucking around anymore." It's it's funny. You're you're like the first interview who's probably seen all of my work. <laughs> yeah. So no, they um, 
that was a an ask from me that I felt more comfortable asking after you know what at that point eight years of working with them, and I I scheduled so the movie Rolling Thunder was a, a kind of an experimental movie in a way because it was the idea was to shoot an entire feature film in one day, and the only way you can do that with any sort of technical prowess is to do the mockumentary route, which everyone I think kind of hears mockumentary and they kind of roll their eyes. But the idea was, what if you could write a really bad short film, go to a set, make that short film and get people like Joe Montaigne, get, I, I asked I the actor Wes Studi to be in it <clears throat> and he was in it. Um, Serena Scott Thomas, who's who's been in a, a ton of stuff. Um, get people to actually go and make a short film with a real crew, but then at the same time, document that process with eight, nine cameras, and that's the movie. So you make like a fake Project Greenlight. And so it was going to be one day of filming, and I got Chicago to, we scheduled it around their tour schedule. So they were going to be in Los Angeles in like the middle of June to play the forum, but they had a day off before it. So I asked their manager, I said, do you think you guys could come and be in my movie on that date? And he's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I was like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> like I thought it was going to be a whole thing, but uh, yeah. And then they came and were in the movie and are hilarious. Jimmy. Yeah, and Jim, Jim, uh, uh, um, from Stuart Panko, who's a <laughs> big fat Jewish actor. I forgot his name. Oh, <laughs> same guy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, there's uh, there's just a great scene with Jimmy, and he really steals the show alongside you know Joe Mantegna. Now, my buddy, my very good friend Alex Collegian, invented. You know, he came up with the idea for Project Greenlight. And I went to watch the first season of that. A buddy of mine, this guy Bruce Terrace from high school, was the first AD. Um, another friend, uh, Pete Jones, was the first winner and subject. And yes, I remember. Yeah, he's the coolest guy. But the reason I'm saying this is that I remember seeing Project Greenlight and thinking, if I won Project Greenlight, I would make it such a shit show to be entertaining and Basically, Rolling Thunder is that shit show that I would have wanted on a film, you know? Just yeah, the way it came out. It was, I mean, just <laughs> hilarious. Not well, the concept cool. of the plot, the concept of the plot is that this kind of, I mean, I hate the word millennial because apparently I'm a millennial, but also someone 15 years younger than me is yeah, a millennial. No? Yeah. It's for the sake of the movie, he's a millennial filmmaker who is really evidently he's very passionate but he's evidently more into the likes so to say and getting a following on instagram or whatever than making he doesn't even know how to make a good movie it's just oh i got these cameras and i got joe montana's in it and i paid yeah. this person to be in it and everything else just falls apart because he doesn't know what he's doing and he doesn't, and, and he doesn't admit that he's doing it wrong Right. And the thing, I think one of the biggest compliments I, I got on the movie was that, and I don't know how you could think this, to be honest, but someone who should be more savvy watched it. And I had a meeting about it because I was, I was, what I was hoping when we made it was, okay, maybe I can find like a comedian or somebody to basically put their name on it and say, so-and-so presents and then that way we can get some type of distribution because so-and-so executive produced it. Um, <clears throat> so I had a meeting at a pretty, you would know what it was. It was a, a big comedy company. And the guy watched it and he's like, he thought it was real, <laughs> which I thought he didn't want it. They didn't want it. And he says, I don't know. I don't, don't feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable putting trying approaching anyone about it because i don't want to like put this filmmaker down and i said oh. i said what do you what do you mean and he's like well you know this could really some of this stuff could really hurt this guy if we put it out and oh my goodness. part of it i think he was letting me down easy he didn't want it at the same time but yes at the same time as like i said i said well it's not 
it's it's fake it's all mm. acting like and he said what and i said those are everyone's acting like it's not he's like thought that joe montani was actually treating the guy like shit and <laughs> chicago was actually treating the guy like shit right. and that was that was what was fun for the actors was or even west studi like the guy who west this studi? year or a year ago was was recognized by uh the uh, the academy yeah oh my well, goodness it was so fun for those guys to be able to be on set and essentially have carte blanche to say the things that they've never been able to or don't because they're professionals. Like someone like Wes and Joe, like those guys, they are the most professional people on the planet. And when you give them the freedom to say what they're thinking, it's really funny to see that everybody, everyone has that filter, but underneath that filter is, God damn, this guy's an idiot. Like, you know what I mean? Right. But at the same time, they're, they're in a, in a strange way, benevolently offering their advice, albeit mm -hmm. in a funny oh, yeah. way. But their advice, <laughs> negative. Really, it, but, but it becomes very serious at the end, which, you know, I credit you for, for one of the great monologues <laughs> um, that Wes Studi delivers basically telling this kid, and I don't know, you draw your own conclusions, you know, you're the one who said millennials, but do you think that, well, obviously you, you know that it serves one right to listen to their elders, but you've, you've basically been sitting and listening to your elders because you've been thrown into uh, a situation where you're in such close proximity to, to real artists who are, are nuanced and have had decades worth of career. Did, uh, do you think that the product of, let's say, new films or people, you know, whoever is the part of the young lions of Hollywood nowadays, do you think that, um, you know, while they might have moxie, are they missing certain things? Do they draw from the greats? I um, would... The real long, young lions of Hollywood, like <clears throat> the Damien Chazelle's, the Ari Aster's, the Safdie brothers who did Uncut Gems. Yeah. Those guys are, they're legit. And oh. I have to constantly tell myself, like, whenever I start to feel like I should be right there alongside doing what they're doing, because I love all of their work. Mm -hmm. Every time I have to kind of stop myself and say, okay, that's four guys. <laughs> I just mentioned four people who are two of them are twins or you, well that's the thing I, that's the joke right. as i always make is that in order to make it young you have to either be like brothers or have a foreign accent or something and then it's like you're kind of lifted but those guys are i mean uncut gems ari Aster did hereditary in midsummer damien chazelle's whiplash and la la land i mean those are legitimately great films that are classics I have to remind myself that's four people. It's really hard to get there. And I do think that there are a lot of young filmmakers who do make terrible films, but I couldn't name them because they're not really making the big ones. I mean, YouTube and, um, you know, streaming platforms do have filmmakers that are making some of their movies but they're not getting the recognition that the other ones do and i don't really care about that like that's going to happen and i don't want to be doing that you know i want to be doing i hope to be making movies soon um where the budget's not too big and i can kind of gradually move up like all those filmmakers did i mean the safety brothers made like their movies looked like they cost five dollars before they they broke even that's not an insult it just means that they wanted to make movies so bad that they made it and damien chazelle's first movie was i think it's called guy and madeline on a park bench and it's very similar it's like whiplash and la la land combined but he made it for i think thirty thousand dollars in black and white 10 years ago mm -hmm. and same with uh ari aster made a ton of short films so Paul Thomas Anderson made a black and BTA. white, uh, yeah, of, of Boogie Nights. As did I think there was even another version of Sling Blade. Mm -hmm. So stop being so hard on yourself. 
Oh, I'm not being hard on myself. I'm just saying, like, I would love to make a movie that's a million dollars, and then the, that one does well. It makes a million five back at the box office or whatever the new box office is in 2021. Makes its money back, and then I make a five million dollar movie, and then I make a twenty million dollar movie. Let's see like, how much I got on me. <laughs> hand it over. <laughs> I don't have anything in my wallet right now. Oh no! But so, um, so what what's going on with uh, now? You just you tell me about. Uh, your move, you got out of, uh, you got out of Dodge, you got out of LA County. Where are you now, Tangiers? Well, we moved to the Austin area mm -hmm. and it was just time. I mean, came to the realization that for first and foremost family, and I just got married last year oh, nice. and just driving around where we lived in Porter Ranch, uh, which is like Northridge area, um, San Fernando Valley. And we loved it there, but the houses were all like $2 million. <laughs> it's like, I don't, right. I'm never going to be able to buy a house. I mean, we had a really nice apartment, but when you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars a year, like most of what you make is going towards where you live. Right. Um, you're never going to be able to save to buy a house unless you like, it's always, that's the realization was, it was always like, well, next year, Right. Next year, maybe this big project will come in and I'll have the money to buy a house. But it's like, do I want to put $300,000 right. into a house? <laughs> and you front? don't have that oppressive vibe that you were that you were running away from. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like we moved to just outside of Austin and it's a change of pace for sure. Not in, not in the way that you'd think. It's just been, I've only been here for like three weeks and it's been really invigorating to feel like you're somewhere else that's you can kind of go back to where you were when you were 18 it's like a new place and you have different kind of inspirations that draw you back to where you were when you were younger and kind of I, I mean I just found it's crazy when I was moving in my mom had given me this box of stuff that they found in storage in Fresno and I found all the rough footage from my first movie in in high school it's like 15 hours Did of, you send me any? Uh, I'll, I'll send it to you right. it's so funny and i went through so it's 15 hours of just everything we didn't light anything it was just like okay angle here angle here right and, and it was uh my friend grant made it with him and i did a movie called black cat with him recently i mean i've been friends with him since second grade um these these two identical twins i made the movie with they live in dallas now Oh, cool. So it's so it's kind of like I watched all this footage and I cut all the fluff out. So I just went through and snipped out all the scenes and just kept the like behind the scenes footage. Oh, cool. And it's like really cool to have an hour long documentation of my personality as an eighteen year old. Isn't that 15, wild? I, someone just posted. Someone just posted. Um, I belong to a uh, a Facebook group of of people who graduated within a certain year frame, you know, time frame at my high school, and it was a private school outside Chicago in Lake Forest, Illinois. Um, and it's wild. Like there was a graduation ceremony and a couple other things that I found myself in as 17 year old. And I was thinking like, I just, I want to just grab this kid. <laughs> yeah. Shake him by the lapels and tell him. Were you an it. innocent kid too? Did you, did you look back and see yourself as like, Oh my God, I thought I was like, I thought I was like, not, a bad person but you always feel like every kind of negative thought you have is who you are yeah I have negative thoughts about myself as a 17 16 year old they're just real not not depressed or anything but just like a normal teenager right. and i watched it and i was like god i was such an innocent happy-go-lucky kid i wish i felt it's, like that now like well you know you, it, it's uh, free. It, what's the line again with almost famous you know well you'll meet them all on the on the road on their road to the middle uh -huh. You know, but you know, I've uh, I really enjoyed, but you know, it's I, I probably knew I was very aware of my innocence, but you know, I can imagine being like you, like I wanted to be older, you know, I wanted to like see the world, so I was intensely curious as I still am, and I want you know, I would I would have I would hang out with my old self then, but I would just say. <laughs> you know. I'd be very candid about stuff without, uh, <laughs> yeah. without, without, you know, free, I, I wouldn't have been freaked out, but at the same time, 
I, I don't think we're alone. You know, I think every oh no, everybody's like that. So what what do you have what do you have going on now? So I uh, I have a script that I've finished that I'm trying to you know obviously this last what everyone's going through right now um, with the uncertainty of just getting money for anything that's a smaller production, but um, it's a, a script about the origins of, of Indian casinos. And um, I've got Wes is on board, Wes Duty. Um, you know, it's just a matter of a finding money and there's some interest. We have some meetings coming up, but then also when can we do it? You know, with, you know, the vaccine is out now. So hopefully I'm hoping that within the next I think that if in the next month and a half the vaccines are, are going out and the overall death numbers go way down, I think people right. are going to feel a lot better about things because this whole ordeal has been, I think the best analogy I've ever heard for it is like, we are all like dogs that have been left at the kennel for, or left at the doggy daycare and they think their owner's never coming back to get them. And the second they see their owner come back, like they're so excited and that's all gone. <sighs> So right. I think right now we're all a little bit uncertain about like, oh man, is this ever going to end? Right. And when it ends, we'll just, there are going to be things that never change and never go back to normal, but um, right. we're going to go back to normal essentially because people yeah. are adaptable to whatever's happening. Yeah. It's, we're not out of the woods yet, you know, but no. I'm, ex, you know, I'll look forward. It'll be like the liberation of France. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> except, except most people didn't go through anything. Like we've That's, all been in our, we've all been I've had in a blast, our, dude. I just, I started this show. This has been great. No. This has been the best time of my life. Oh no, that's a joke. Um, but, but as far yeah. as you know, but what, uh, <laughs> you know, I was thinking you know, about Chicago and you'd said that how we knew each other. I could honestly say without embellishing that I was replaced um, with, I was in a band with my very good friend and still play with him when I can, Mike Datz. He replaced me with the current bassist of Chicago, Brett Stevens. He's a great, he's a great bass player. Brett Simons. Nice too. I like how he changed his name. <laughs> so what is it? Brett Simons. I it's I'm funny. I'm cutting that out. <laughs> no, you no, don't cut it out. <laughs> Who's Brett Stevens? Let's do it again. Let, let's do it again. No. Brett no, Stevens. no, no, just, no, I was, uh, what? So, you know, I'm, he's I'm a sorry. Good guy. No, you know, I'm sorry, know. Mr. Simons. <laughs> <laughs> it's, That's revenge, so funny. it's revenge for replacing you. No, you know what? He's, he's he a good guy. Well, then I used to, I saw him. He would always come through town with someone different. He was in with Liz Fair once and, uh, just That's a right, Brian Wilson. Yep. Bassist. Yeah. He's a bassist bassist. He's just cool. And he always had the prettiest guy. girlfriend. So, great bass player. But he, yes. um, it's amazing that you know all these people. Like I'm still, for hey man, anyone who uh, doesn't know, he's he. Steve knows everyone. Old. I've been around <laughs> the block, Peter. You know, I've been in jail. No, I'm kidding. What? It it's, it's fun. You know, it's like meeting nice people. But I want to, um, I'm you know, I want to, I want to. Keep, keep tabs on you and i want to have you back on the show is there anything else you want to talk about you got to do anything i am just we're just getting settled here in texas and loving it and uh how can people yeah. see your films so they're all available on itunes for the most part itunes um a couple of them are on amazon uh chicago the chicago documentaries on amazon prime right now um, Rolling Thunders on iTunes to rent and buy. Um, I did a documentary called Fat that's also on Amazon um, and iTunes. That was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Shame me into eating better. No, <laughs> I, I, this last, I, I need to get back to it too. It's like just not easy, but it's, holidays, dude. it's good. I know around the holiday times, but yeah. Well, listen, man, you're the best. Uh, you're the best that ever was. Uh, <laughs> let's let's. Uh, you too. Thank you. Let's 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 uh, let's make it happen another time soon, as Chicago says. We can make it happen. Don't go away. I'm just gonna end our meeting here, bud. Okay. <laughs>